Howdy, folks. It's 3.50 in the afternoon. You must be relatively tired. Let's all stand up for just one moment, just really quickly, just do some stretching. Uh, yes, that is good. That is good. Now you can all sit down and promptly fall asleep. Uh, howdy, my name's Vic. I'm a cloud solutions architect with Google. Uh, I live out of Santa Barbara, California. Some contact info for me. It'll be on the last slide if you need it. Um, we're here to talk about you know, what we've learned from the Helm Charts repo um, and things that you can use in your own Helm Charts uh, to make them more flexible, more scalable, just better for your users in general. So how many people have used Helm? It's a lot. Uh, how many people use Helm in production? How many people have used Helm charts from the charts repo? Wow, that's amazing. Uh, and how many people write their own charts? Yes, sweet, okay. You guys are committed, I like it. Um, so I've got this like Kubernetes problem, I'm like into it, I get into Kubernetes mode, um, and it just makes me go all crazy. Um, today we're gonna go a little bit Helm 101, for those of you who didn't you know, get an opportunity to use Helm uh, in the past, but as you can see, We've got a good community of users, and uh, it's a useful tool. It can be a useful tool for you. Uh, then we're gonna go through what the charts repo is, why we started it, and that kind of thing. Uh, and then talk a little bit about the important pieces of charts, and then a couple tips and tricks that we've seen in some of the, the charts that we have in the chart repo, some of the patterns that we've seen emerge uh, for making them uh, better charts for your users. So Helm 101, Helm is a a tool for installing and managing your Kubernetes applications, so it helps you with the life cycle management of an application within Kubernetes, and we'll talk about what that is. Uh, it has two parts. You install a client on your laptop, and then inside your Kubernetes cluster, you have a server called the tiller, uh, and that manages kind of receiving the commands and doing the actual work of deploying uh, manifests into Kubernetes. Uh, so Helm, if you're kind of looking for an analog in the operating system world, uh, it would be like apt-get or yum. And then you have charts, which are more like your packages, so your RPMs or your Debian. Um, and chart has metadata about what's in the chart, what it is, and then a bunch of manifests that are templated uh, so that you can have ease of use and, and uh, pass some values through it. Um, so what is a Kubernetes application? This is something that's kind of been Tough to figure out over time, like what is an application? And generally, it's gonna be a set of things that you install into Kubernetes. Um, they may relate to each other. You may have a config map that needs to be attached to a pod. You may have a volume that needs to be attached to a pod, and then a pod that needs to be load balanced by a service. So these things are kind of all interrelated. You can't really update one without thinking about the other at the very least. Um, and they're, they're all written in YAML uh, for most of us. How many people do YAML uh, for Kubernetes manifests, yeah, most of us. Um, so Helm allows you to package these things together. So you can templatize them and use the same values across a bunch of these manifests and then install them all together. Um, for your users of, of these packages or these charts, um, they can see just a simplified config, right? The, the things that are important to the application. Uh, they don't have to worry about the internals of how your services are mapped to each other or how your deployments work or what env variables you're using. You can provide them kind of a higher level abstraction API um, via uh, the, the values file or the configuration of, of your Helm chart. So you deploy your Helm chart and then you deploy a new version and that's awesome um, and you're stoked on your new version and then you hit a problem and you're like, wait, uh, we need to roll back. So in this case, Helm helps you because it can roll back everything as a whole, right? You don't just roll back the config map, you don't just roll back the deployment, you roll everything back together and get back to the original state you had before. Um, and then you can roll out version three and keep going along the way. So I've talked uh, about templating, I've said templating probably 50 times already. Um, in Helm, you use Go templates, um, and those uh, are passed uh, into your, you have values passed into your templates um, that you can kind of uh, parse out some, some values there. So for example here, um, I have this replicas that I've provided to my users where they can change the number of replicas um, by using the, the values file. Um, you can also use similar names for things. So if your service is called, 
you know, Vix, or if your application is called Vix app, um, I can call my service Vix app and my uh, deployment uh, Vix app with just the, these, these templated values. Uh, some of the cool things that you get out of using Helm on top of uh, just regular Go templating is we have these things called sprig functions. And these are little helper functions that make it easier to do some of the more complex things like have a default value uh, or writing a checksum for um, a particular config file. So here are some of the things that sprig allows you to do. So on you know, Go template, we have all kinds of things we can do like loops and stuff like that, but sprig allows you to do like math functions, or maybe you need to add a date or a timestamp somewhere. Maybe you need to base64 encode a config file for some reason or another. Uh, so this gives you a lot of flexibility as far as how you're writing your, your configs and, and your services and stuff like that. Cool. So the charts repo, uh, Kubernetes slash charts on GitHub. Um, it's the centralized repository where we're hosting uh, and maintaining the charts that you as a community have provided. How many people have interacted with the charts repo in here? Awesome, we love you, thank you. Um, and it's basically just a place where we can get together and take our knowledge of applications and how you configure them and how you use them and so that everybody has a, at least a starting point. Um, I don't necessarily expect that you're gonna have you know, production workload running off of one of our Helm charts, but maybe it's the first step to, for you to get there. Um, we provide continuous integration, so we have a testing uh, subsystem that will run your chart and make sure that it passes the linter, make sure it actually installs properly, make sure that pods go running. Um, and then we have code review provided by some of our maintainers. Or do we have any maintainers in here right now, other than myself? We have one right here. That's it. He, oh, one in the back too. So they, they caused all the problems. Um, and uh, it's the default repository when you install Helm. So uh, the stable repository when you install the Helm client or you do a Helm search, uh, those are the charts that we have there. So why did we do this? Um, I don't know if you guys remember in like a year and a half ago if you did like Postgres Kubernetes Google search, you'd end up with lots of results, lots of different repos that had similar ideas on how to do things and were maybe had you know, trade-offs as to what they did. Um, and so you'd have to look to do 10 results and decide which one was best for you. Um, we wanted a place where we could just all work together on the same thing uh, and make it as easy as possible to have a starting point for those uh, common apps. Um, so there was a bunch of things. Then we added one more thing, creating a new standard. But this time I think it's, it's stuck around. Um, we have 130 charts now. A year ago, I think we had nine or something like that. Um, so it's, it's grown pretty, pretty fast. Uh, we've merged 2,000 PRs over that period, so that's imp improvements to charts and new charts. Uh, and we have over 100 contributors, which are you know, the folks that you saw raise their hands, which is super awesome. Uh, it's not slowing down in any way, shape, or form. We're still kind of hammering through uh, lots of PRs. Uh, about six months ago, we had like this high watermark of about 100 PRs being like, we need to drop everything and figure out what's going on here. Now the high watermark is 200. I expect in another three months it's gonna be 300. Um, we'd love to have more maintainers if you're interested uh, to, to keep those watermarks down, but it's, uh, it's growing really fast and it, it's awesome. Uh, we have 10,000 unique visitors every week to the Charts GitHub repository, which is a lot of people. Um, and the number of forks, we can no longer see our, our fork graph, which is a really great display, um, but we do have the number, and this is cool for me, not, not like as a vanity metric, but this means that people are actually taking the code and doing something with it. Maybe they're changing it, maybe they're contributing back, but at least they have that starting point, and we're kind of the known place to go for those starting points for these applications. Cool. So next we'll move on to kind of uh, the chart structure and things that are important with the files in charts. So the chart structure, there's a certain set of files that make up a chart. Um, one of the most important ones is the chart YAML, and this is the metadata about what your application is, what thing is this installing. So here's the example from uh, the Spinnaker chart. Um, you have an API version, that's the API version of the chart. Right now we're only at V1. Um, you have the description, which is a human readable way to describe what you're actually installing. This shows up in the Helm search output, for example. You have the name of your chart. And then you have two version strings here. So version is the version of the chart, and app version is what the application version is. So for example, uh, here I have version 1.1.0 of Spinnaker, and the chart version, the iteration of this deployment mechanism, is 0.3.8. 
Um, this is important. We've had some chart maintainers try to pin these things, and what you find is over time, your application doesn't change as much as your chart. You're adding things that make your chart more flexible or a bug fix in just your chart, and then you're adding you know, uh, bumping versions. Uh, Mike goodness here was one of our first ones to try that with the Prometheus chart. I think he went about three months with that methodology and then we just decided to break from it. Um, you have a website here, which is just a URL to point people to, but I think the more important thing to, to have in your chart YAML is the sources. Where can people go to rebuild the pieces of this? So for example, usually people put the GitHub of the actual project itself. A lot of the, the charts that we have are open source, so where is the GitHub for that thing? And then did you build like a custom image? If you have a custom image, point people to that Docker file so they can maybe customize it and move on from there. Um, you have an icon, which is mostly just a visualization tool. We have cubeapps.com, which uses this to, to show um, your, your chart uh, icon. And then we have the maintainer. So it, the name here is actually the, the GitHub ID of that user and their email. So as maintainers, we look at this, and if there's something that's a little bit over our head, something that's not just a trivial bug fix, um, we try to ping those maintainers to make sure that this is a good change that they want in their chart. Now this is the values file. The values file is basically the API that you're providing to your users of your chart. That's the, the way to look at it. Changes to this that are backwards incompatible, you should probably bump the major version of your chart to show people that you are breaking the API. Um, here's where you can abstract away some of the complexity of what you've done in the Kubernetes deployment methodology uh, and, and make it simpler for your users to configure things. You can add comments. Generally, people comment in uh, how to do uh, certain things. For example, here, this is again the Spinnaker chart. I allow people to change the images that are deployed for each component uh, and also, for example, allow them to configure how uh, mail works. It's disabled by, by default, but I have just the, the parameters that they need and they don't have to go look in the Spinnaker configuration to figure out what things to, to configure there. So with the, the values file, generally what you'll find is you're on this spectrum, um, or just uh, charts in general. You start out kind of relatively reproducible. There's not that much that can change. Um, but as people use your chart and your application, you'll find that you're going more and more to be more flexible, um, which means that you're opening up some trap doors for people to change things that maybe you can, maybe you can't reproduce on your own. Um, and that's just kind of a natural progression at this point that we've seen. Uh, another thing that we have in, in a chart is the requirements YAML. And this is what defines what other charts you may want to deploy alongside your chart. So in general, what we've seen is this is used for um, data stores. You have a Postgres dependency, you have a Redis dependency, or anything like that. Um, and uh, the version here can also be a semver. So I can say, you know, give me anything in the 04x uh, uh, series of the Redis chart and you'll update uh, to those things. Then you have your templates folder, and this is kind of the core of the chart, or the, the kind of uh, like a simplest uh, place. You have all of your Kubernetes manifests that are templated out, uh, or can be templated, uh, and this is what will be kind of cube controlled applied uh, to a certain extent into your, your Kubernetes cluster. Next you have the notes file, and this is uh, one of my favorite kind of experiences in Helm uh, or using Helm is that the notes you can, as a chart uh, maintainer or chart uh, creator, you can provide to your users a getting started experience uh, via the notes file. And the notes file is again a templated file that uh, is templated out and spit out after your chart is installed. So when you do Helm install chart, um, they'll spit out this templated thing that can maybe tell your users what to do next. Right? Instead of just saying, yes, it's installed, tell them, hey, here's how you connect to it. Here's how you get to the web UI. Here's, if you're gonna use it inside of your cluster, here's the service name that's currently in, uh, uh, configured. Uh, so it's, it's just getting people that much closer to being, uh, kind of interacting with your application. Next is a readme. Uh, and this is generally kind of more in-depth uh, 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 documentation on what people can do with your chart, and it may have you know, methodologies for configuration or things to watch out for or disclaimers, uh, things like that. It's just a markdown document and kind of gets into more in-depth information. So now we're gonna go look at uh, some tricks that you can use 
inside of your charts and things that you can look at uh, to kind of make your charts a little bit more flexible or a, bit, a little bit more useful. Uh, I think the first thing that uh, most people uh, should be using is when they're first gonna create their charts to use the Helm create command. Uh, how many people have used Helm create or use it regularly? Yeah, that's good. Um, so Helm create scaffolds out uh, a chart, an example chart for you. So you can start with this and then tweak it from there. The actual application that it deploys is just an Nginx web server with no config, uh, but it just shows you the things, the elements that you're gonna have to have, uh, and we try to keep that up to date with our best practices. So if you're gonna get something into the charts repo, it's best to start with this, and then you know you've got something that's gonna match our expectations. Um, another thing you can do is to add starters. So let's say in your organization, you have certain patterns or certain things that you want to have in each Helm chart. You can create your own starter templates uh, and then pass them to the Helm create command with the dash dash starter flag uh, and have that be the scaffolded thing that gets put out there for users of, of your charts. So super useful. Uh, one example is you, know, you have a per certain paradigm for how you do stateful sets. Or for your services, you have a certain way that you want to do your deployment rollouts or your deployment strategy, right? You want to do max unavailable always. So just set that for folks so that they have it by default. Maybe you have a certain way that your values files are laid out. This is where you can put all of those uh, semantics in place. Uh, this is a, a trick that I really like. I've used it in a, in a couple charts, and I know that some charts use it as well. Um, and it's slightly complicated, but it, it's a very useful tool. So what I want to do here is I want to be able to change a config map in my application, in my chart, uh, and have it automatically update my deployment. So what I'm going to do here is add an annotation to the deployment, uh, and I'm going to use sprig functions to put in a checksum of my configuration. So here you can see I have uh, the, I'm printing a full uh, templated uh, config file, that uh, spinnaker-config-.yaml, uh, and then getting the checksum of that, that contents. When I get that, I'm putting that into an annotation. So every time the config file changes, it's gonna roll out a new deployment because that annotation changed. Um, so it's kind of a little trick to get config maps to automatically update. Some applications will just detect that the config map has changed and reload themselves, um, but some aren't that smart. So you can do this to kind of hack around those applications that don't know about config maps. Another super useful tool um, that I've used in some of the less than cloud native uh, kind of applications that I've had to install is the Helm hooks. So Helm lets you uh, do some things uh, as it releases or as it installs or deletes your, your uh, application. So here I'm doing a post install step. So let's say you deploy an application and you just need to like run one command at the end. Like for example in this one, this is again the Spinnaker chart, and I need to create a bucket in the Minio object storage after it's installed. So Helm allows me to add an annotation to a job. That job is gonna run until it completes um, part of the job controller. Um, and all I'm really doing in that job is just running the Minio client in order to create the bucket. So as Minio's coming up, this thing's gonna fail, and Kubernetes is gonna keep restarting it until it su succeeds once, and then it's done. So now I've gotten those kind of post init kind of steps uh, automated through my chart. Um, the types of hooks that you have available are uh, pre and post install, pre and post delete, and pre and post upgrade, and pre and post rollback. So you have a lot of control over your application lifecycle. You can imagine doing migrations and those kinds of things in, in one of these hooks. Um, all kinds of stuff that you might have to do at, at install or just normally throughout the process of, of managing your application. This one is pretty useful. Um, something we saw, I think, first in the, the Prometheus chart uh, is to allow people to basically provide you with a volume for data. Um, and so you let them provide you with the name of an existing uh, persistent volume claim, and if they provide that to you, you use that rather than one that you would have originally provisioned in the chart. Um, so you might have the, the, the need to decouple your chart lifecycle from your data lifecycle. Maybe you don't want those ever to, you know, you, you don't want someone to accidentally delete data. Or you have a developer who has a PVC that's their like special data set PVC that they want to reuse with your application chart over and over. Um, you can give them that ability here. Another thing that we've seen often is 
web apps being you know, submitted to the charts repo. And with those web apps, we generally ask that they allow someone to add an ingress really easily. Like, pre-configure this ingress. You wire up the service and port already for them. You can have you know, the ability for them to list host names or maybe a TLS secret to include in there. But try to have that as part of your API if you are a web app, because most things will want to do uh, um, uh, an ingress. Uh, another side of configuring an ingress for, for people is to have uh, the annotations be available as uh, a thing that you pass in to, uh, to those ingresses. So annotations on ingresses that are really common are, for example, like which type of ingress controller to use. You might use the Nginx ingress controller, you might use the, the cloud default one, but you as a chart maintainer should not dictate that necessarily. Uh, another one that's seen commonly is like Cube Lego, go get my TLS certs. Um, you don't want to necessarily manage that. You don't want to over, you know, abstract that. Just let them add their own annotations. Um, annotations are kind of like Pandora's box anyway. All kinds of crazy stuff gets done with them. So I tend to just let people add those crazy annotations there. This one is near and dear to my heart. Um, uh, Michelle uh, Norali wrote this Helm test thing. Um, and we like, we're like, please, we need Helm test because as maintainers, we want to have the ability for the chart uh, maintainer to send us a test that says this thing actually works. Um, so now you can do Helm test uh, from the, the, the Helm client after a release has been uh, installed, and it will run a step. And so here I add an annotation saying that I want uh, this uh, test to run, and I expect it to succeed. Um, here I'm running a, a pod, and it's just going to run a bash script. Uh, like, like most things, the world is tied together via bash scripts. So here, uh, this is the actual test that's in the Jenkins chart. Not the craziest thing in the world, but it lets us know that like, we can at least get a 200 from the login page. Right? Something simple like this that as chart maintainers we can bank on uh, to think that you know, your chart's actually doing something useful. Um, in, your, in your organization you may have much more in-depth testing, uh, and you can run this at any time. So maybe you just run this periodically. You have some checks that you want to run uh, as part of automation that runs every two hours or something like that, and it just spot checks things. Um, it's also templated, so it's going to be able to use all those values um, that you've passed around as well. So it's, it's a useful hook to have. Um, we hope to have more tests in, in the charts repo. I think right now, out of the 130, less than 10% have tests. Um, which is pretty painful. It means we have to go and launch it and make sure that it actually does anything useful um, and that the, P the PR that we're accepting doesn't actually break core fun functionality for that, for that chart. This is one that I think is, is really useful, but is also one of these trap doors that people kind of, once they go down this route, you kind of ha they're on their own. Um, some people will want to, if you have a config file for your application, Rather than have you template it out, for example, for an Nginx config or something like that, they want to just provide their own. So some charts have done uh, you know, custom config map uh, parameter that allows you to overwrite or provide your own uh, config map. This is like on the opposite side of the reproducibility spectrum. I mean, you're not really going to be able to reproduce what they did basically ever. Um, but it, it does open up more use cases for your chart, which I think is, is useful. Uh, another thing we've seen uh, in the Nginx controller chart is not just having a, a, them overwrite the config map, but to provide the name of a config map. Um, so it can be, can be done a few different ways. One thing we've done recently uh, is to have all of the helper templates in Helm charts be namespaced. So a helper template, um, if you look at a chart, you'll probably have an underscore helpers uh, file in there. And this is where you can define little chunks of, of snippets of code um, that you want to actually inject in different places in your, in your chart, but you don't want to have a big stack of code sitting there. Um, so these templates can be uh, generally for like names of things. Uh, in Kubernetes, you have to have things be a certain length. So uh, if people name things in a strange way, you want to truncate that to something that's uh, um, supported within Kubernetes. So that's what we do with names and full names. Um, namespacing it allows us, if, if you have this chart as a subchart, for example, you can always reference the Jenkins name by Jenkins.name across the board. You don't have to think about how it's actually nested or anything like that. This one is also really useful. Um, so conditional dependencies is a feature of the requirements file. 
Uh, a lot of charts, uh, we expect charts to actually provide something useful out of the box with, without any changes to the values. Um, but you may have some data stores, for example, that we deploy for you as, as the chart um, that you already have somewhere else. So one example is uh, the Spinnaker chart actually does, uh, needs object storage. So we use Minio uh, by default because we can provision that within anybody's cluster and we get an out-of-the-box experience that's good. Within cloud providers, though, you want to use their object storage. So in Google Cloud, we have Google Cloud Storage, and in Amazon, you might have S3. So you want, might want to disable the Minio deployment, uh, and you can do that with a value called Minio.enabled. Uh, so if you set that to false, we will no longer deploy the Minio chart for you, and you are on your own to configure the S3 configuration. Again, on the kind of opposite end of the spectrum, um, these are, are some more of the, the trap doors that, that uh, we've seen I mean, chart maintainers provide uh, to their users, um, is the, uh, using the to YAML function in Sprig, which will basically take a chunk of the values file and just inject it as YAML into some other uh, template that you have. So where this is you know, really useful and kind of necessary is with like node selectors and tolerations specifically, because these are gonna be practically bespoke across everybody's deployment. You're not gonna know how they label their deployment or their nodes or anything like that. So just give them the ability to add node selectors on their own in the values file and then uh, propagate those through to the deployments you have. Uh, similarly with tolerations. Um, we also have seen this uh, relatively often with resources. Some people want to have requests and limits. Some people only want limits. You know, just give them the ability to set those uh, however they want through the values file and pass that directly into your pod, your pod specs. So those are some of the, the tips and tricks. We have 130 charts out there. So if you have an application that you want to deploy, Go look at the charts repo and see if there's something that's similar to it from a kind of deployment mechanism standpoint and try to figure out if you can kind of take some tips from some of the charts that already exist. Um, for us uh, in the charts repo, the next thing we're, we're going to try to do is give the chart uh, maintainers more uh, power over their actual chart and merging their own PRs. Um, that's gonna help us with our velocity so we don't hit that 300 PR mark that uh, is almost inevitable at this point. Um, and also to delegate uh, the responsibility to maybe even a different Git repo. So if you wanna host your, your Git repo or your chart somewhere else, but still get it into the stable chart repository, we wanna be able to facilitate that as well. Um, now that we're at 130 charts, um, it's time to look at how many of those are actually updated or useful uh, and are still maintained. I think we'll get at least a 15% uh, attrition rate on those once we really start looking at it uh, and just remove those from the tree or put them in a folder somewhere like deprecated or something like that. And if someone wants to bring them back to life, that's great. Um, maybe we'll call it zombie. Um, and, and then you know, we, can, we can go forward with it. Um, the other thing is more functional tasks for charts. There's an idea being thrown around that will require a functional test or else we won't merge any more PRs in that. Um, I don't know if that makes you scared or not, but it should be scary for any maintainers. Um, but it, the, the functional test is really important to us. It's something that gives us more comfort in merging things um, and will give us better uh, velocity as, a, as chart maintainers. So that's all I've got. Thank you, folks. Um, and I'll do questions out in the back.